Hello, everyone, and welcome to day two of the Humanities Podcast Network Symposium. We were delighted to have some really incredible presentations yesterday and are so excited for everything that's ahead. I'm delighted to be kicking off this morning with Peter, Peter Fristet of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And I wanna say a big thank you to Marilyn Kubit of our committee for helping to put this together. Peter has served as Senior Program Officer for the National Endowment for the Humanities in the Division of Public Programs for the past 11 years. Prior to that, he was a lecturer at Towson University and a special assistant professor and instructor at Hofstra University. Peter earned his PhD in philosophy from Stony Brook University and holds a BA in philosophy and English from Connecticut College. We are overjoyed to welcome him here today as a representative of the NEH, which is the largest federal funder of the humanities in the nation, to tell us a bit about some of the best practices he would recommend if you ever consider applying for an NEH grant. Please join us in warmly welcoming Peter Fristet. Thank you so much, Rebecca and uh, Mary Ellen as well. And um, you know everyone here at the Humanities Podcast Network, I'm super excited to spend the next uh, short amount of time with you and talking about, yeah, best practices for applying for an NEH grant and really very specifically for a, uh, an NEH media projects grant. Um, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of an overview of of uh, that grant program and then dive into uh, some best practices. Um, let's see here, move myself forward. There we go. Uh, so first off though, just a quick overview of uh, the agency. So we are a small independent federal agency. We were founded in 1965 uh, alongside the NEA um, by Congress. And I, I will let you kind of read our mission statement there. Uh, basically we are all about bringing the humanities to uh, the people. Um, okay, so media project. Uh, this is the grant program where we fund podcasts um, at NEH. Uh, we also, in media projects, support uh, other types of uh, media, so documentary films, television series, uh, radio, um, all, everything, every project we're supporting in media projects is uh, aimed or ought to be aimed at broad public audiences. That's sort of one of the, the basic aims of the program. Um, we do offer production awards for podcasts, um, and we we have in the past offered development funding. Uh, we can talk about that a little bit later if anyone's interested. Uh, but for podcasts, production awards available for up to three hundred fifty thousand dollars. Two deadlines a year in January and August. That January one is coming up soon, um, and then uh, the grant supports a fully produced and distributed podcast. And uh, you can see the funding ratio. This is going back for about five years um, on average, the average funding ratio in media projects as a whole. Okay, uh, just quickly, funded activities in, in media projects. I uh, think just to, again, in the spirit of an overview of the grant program. Um, so, you know, it is production and distribution of a podcast, but also lots of other things as well, refining your scripts and treatments, uh, meeting with humanities scholars. This is a really important part of any grant that we're making, right? We're, we require you to uh, recruit a group of uh, humanities scholars with relevant uh, expertise for your project. And we wanna see you uh, meeting and talking with them really throughout the project for to make sure that you, you have a strong humanities project. Um, we're also supporting outreach and public engagement, a crucial part of getting uh, these podcasts out in front of listeners. Okay, and then real quick, who is eligible? These grants are not available for individuals, but they are available for organizations of different kinds. And those are the four categories there of, uh, of eligible applicant um, for this grant and really most grants at NEH actually uh, that are not targeted to in individuals. Okay, um, so best practices. I have a, a handful of slides here, so I'll just kind of talk you through them. Um, and some of these apply to really uh, any grant program at NEH, um, and, and they apply across the board. Some of them are more specific to uh, media projects and, and podcasting. So getting started early, um, super, super important, right? Uh, our, our, uh, the notice of funding opportunity, so this is our RFP, uh, is you know are, are lengthy and you know voluminous and uh, it takes a lot of time to put together an NEH application. So really getting the ball rolling early uh, is going to be key. And reading that notice of funding opportunity 
through from cover to cover. Uh, there's lots of details in there, lots of information. Um, and so really familiarizing yourself with it is going to be uh, important. And I'll show you where to find that in a few minutes. I'm going to go over our website as well. Um, you In that notice of funding opportunity, you will find funding restrictions. You'll find lots of things. But uh, one thing to kind of pull out and, and focus on is our funding restrictions. So, you know, those the types of activities we don't fund. Uh, and uh, and also our review criteria. Uh, so this is, um, you know, we publish the, the evaluation review criteria that our external reviewers uh, um, hold each application up to and sort of uh, evaluate according to. Uh, and so knowing what those are and really building kind of answers to those criteria into your application is uh, is sort of a, a good way to go. Um, reading sample proposals, we do include those on our website um, of funded projects. You'll you see what a successful project looks like and a successful proposal. So it looks like I'll tell you where to find those in a minute as well. Um, okay. Other best practices. So um, really, again, you know, you have that team of scholars advising the project, getting those folks on board early, starting conversations with them so that your those conversations can inform the project. Um, also, on the kind of more creative side, right, so uh, consulting or even working with uh, a experienced humanities podcast producer, uh, we ask for uh, samples of prior work, right, and so especially this is especially true if you are kind of early in this, uh, either early, in, you know, starting off in podcasting or you've done other types of podcast work, but not necessarily work in the humanities, right, so, you know, someone who can kind of speak that language, um, that can really enhance an application. Um, as I've said, these are long applications, um, and so conducting extensive research on the subject, right? Uh, we want to we want to really you're, you're going to get a chance to kind of demonstrate that knowledge in the application, um, and so having that work in your in your back pocket is is going to be valuable. Um, having you know doing some uh, archival work and preliminary interviews that can inform your your treatments um, and, uh, you know, give us a sense of where you want to take these, uh, the, you know, the series or the episodes that you want to produce. Uh, and then identifying clear humanities themes um, based on scholarship unfamiliar to public audiences. There's kind of a lot to unpack in this one, but, uh, you know, we, we ask for a set of kind of audience takeaways. We want you to be clear on those. Um, it should be based on humanity scholarship, but not necessarily like freshly minted humanities scholarship, right? That that is like new and exciting for scholars. But um, you know what it should be is scholarship that is has not yet kind of trickled down to the public consciousness, right? Um, okay. And then finally, maybe the most important of all um, is to reach out to one of us at the agency, a program officer um, like myself, one of my colleagues. There's uh, eight of us in the public programs division. We all. We all work on kind of all of our grant lines um, and we can, we're very happy to talk to you and help you figure out, you know, fit with the agency, fit with the grant program, uh, competitiveness of your idea and, you know, your project idea. We can, you know, and give you lots of suggestions like I'm doing today on making it more competitive. Uh, and also we do read drafts of proposals um, and uh, so submitting a draft for feedback, we publish those deadlines. They're generally about five weeks before the application deadline. So actually for that January 8th application deadline, uh, December 4th is the draft deadline. And we'll provide yeah, written feedback, oral feedback on, on those. Okay, I just quickly kind of a, a website best practices here. So, um, you know, the NEH website uh, does have a landing page for every grant program. You have the URL there, um, but you can also just Google Media Projects NEH and you will get there very quickly. Um, uh, tons of information on the landing page here. So really kind of using this as a one-stop shop. Uh, I'll just circle there about the program. That's the first tab. Uh, you, you can find like videos of, uh, um, you know, kind of webinars uh, with all kinds of information about applying, um, description of the program, all the key uh, information on deadlines and so on are up there on the right. Um, application instruction. So that arrow is pointing to the notice of funding opportunity. Again, this is the RFP, the application Bible. Right under that, the grants.gov application package. This is will actually link you to where you can submit your application. We got some FAQs on there, lists of awards, so you can see what we funded. And then right at the bottom, uh, I, I'm not going to sort of scroll or anything to this, but you see sample application narratives, and that's where you can find those 
those uh, funded uh, project narratives. Okay. And then just finishing with a few examples of podcasts we have funded recently. So this is just to give you a sense of the range of institutions who have uh, applied and received funding, right? So a couple of universities there, we have a state historical society, Winter Gren is, uh, is a, supports an work in anthropology, and then Radio Diaries, of course, uh, an in independent podcast and radio uh, production company. Um, so that is it. Um, thanks. Uh, that's my little presentation, leave you with some contact information. Uh, that's my email address at the bottom, and then public PGMS at neh.gov is the public programs general uh, inbox if you want to send a kind of general query. Um, so yeah, I think we have a, yeah, okay, a few minutes for questions. Um, and so uh, if anyone wants to, um, uh, I don't know if Mary Ellen, if you want to come back um, or and, and sort of field some questions, but i um, very happy to take questions from, from folks. How about this? I think for ease, I would recommend, could we have people kindly raise their hands if they have a question? Otherwise, type it into the chat and we'll try to spot it and give you a shout out. That's not great. Okay, let me maximize. Actually, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Okay, so I can see folks. Um, let's see. Okay. Pardon me here. Um, okay. So uh, Milan, I will take uh, I'll take your question. You're like first hand with you. Okay, thank you. Um I, I wanted to ask a bit more about what you were saying about the broad public audience. Um, because my sense of where the kind of discussion within universities about public humanities is moving is towards projects that are not targeting broad general publics, but really small specific audiences and sort of challenging the idea that there is such a thing as a general public. Yeah. And I just wanted to hear how you think about that. Would a kind of narrower audience be at a disadvantage for this um, particular grant? And just, yeah, what does broad publics mean for the NEH? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. Um, and so I would say uh, it, it is in our, just remit uh, and in just in the, the division. So it, you'll like every grant program we run has that, yes, very vague, very perhaps problematic notion of the audience, right? As as it's kind of the target audience. And part of that is, right, we're a national funder, we're part of the US government. Um, you know, the our, our aim is to have as, you know, a broad reach as possible. That said, right, an audience plan in your application that just says, I wanna reach everybody, right? Um, it doesn't really make sense, right? Um, so having having narrower target audiences in mind is actually totally fine. Um, you know, having sort of, you know, like specific groups of people or, you know, demographics or whatever that you want to reach is totally fine. However, um, we, we do kind of caution against, um, you know, targeting audiences in such a way or developing, or we, we would be less likely to support a project that it's developed in such a way um, that kind of only speaks to that kind of smaller group of people, right? So you do want to um, at least, you know, at least have it be possible that folks who from sort of outside of that target group um, who kind of come across, you know, your project and whose interest is sparked might be like, okay, yeah, that sounds really interesting. I want to give that a listen, right? So I'd say that's that's my sort of quick and dirty answer to that, that question. Yeah. Which Thank is you. Question. Thanks, that's yeah. really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, let's see, Kim Adams. Sorry, am I next or is? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, Thank you. Okay. Great. <laughs> um, hi. Thank you so much um, for your presentation. Um, I would really love it if you could tell us a little bit more about the humanities themes. Um, that part I've uh, of the application I've found sort of like the most perplexing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so like very narrow, and we, we do provide some kind of narrow language on it, but very narrowly, um, a, you know, a theme is a kind of uh, like a, a, a statement, right, that, that an, an interpretive analytical statement, right, that you want 
um, audiences to kind of um, walk away with as uh, right something they've kind of learned or like a takeaway, right? Um, I think we, we do also say things, you know, we, we want you to raise questions, we want you to, um, you know, sort of develop a set of like humanities ideas. And a, plenty, a lot of, lots of times people do submit applications where, you know, the theme is like, um, I don't know, uh, whatever. Um, it's just, I'm, I'm trying to think of an example, but, you know, some like a topic, right? So, um, uh, you know, 1950s, right, um, you know, music in New York City or something, I don't know, just random example. Um, and we're not gonna like rule you out, <laughs> right? If that's your your thing, You're, you could still get funded. Um, but so what's what we really, what we wanna see though, is that you have some sense of audience takeaways. That's really what we're looking for, right? So like it can be an exploration, it could be raising questions, it could be, um, you know, sort of sowing seeds in the audience's minds. Um, but really we want like something a little more concrete as well. And that is that is what we call a theme. Um, and it's, you know, uh, something, you know, so the audience kind of really learns something about your uh, your topic, your subject matter. Okay. Um, I, don't, I don't know if that helps or I'm very yeah, happy. Well, can I ask a follow-up question? So, cause I think because, you know, in podcasting, the way podcasts often work is you like cover a a topic in each episode yes of the podcast right but that's yep. not the same thing as the themes right Correct. yeah okay so the themes are there's that something is, that overarching or yeah yes it is more overarching um it is more challenging when you and we see this with, with applications so if you know if you submit an application right that is like 10 episodes and each episode is on a different topic right um and then, so like, what are the what are the themes there? And we do we do want you to try to kind of, I'll, I'll put it this way. So like, a proposal will, will probably be less competitive um, if it's let's say a ten episode example, right? If it's ten like totally disparate kind of topics, right? That really maybe they're pulled together kind of by you know the the host or by the storytelling style or something like that. But in terms of like you know topic overlap like there's really not much connecting them that's those will generally do a little less well than if there is sort of some overlap and so yeah the themes in that case become if you're you're looking at your um you know your set of episodes right um like what are what can you sort of pull out of those like an audience someone in the audience who, who you know you do a really good job and they want to listen to every single one right like what are they getting out of that experience right like what are what are the kind of bigger ideas that they're going to take out of it. It is a lot easier to do this if you have a series, right, that is telling one story, <laughs> right? There's kind of like one historical narrative or something from, you know, episode one to episode 10, um, then it is a lot easier to do. But we do fund plenty of these um, types of projects, you know, so like Radio Diaries, for example, right? Like they'll, um, you know, they have like quite different topics, but they do, you know, they do pull out a few, a handful of um, themes in their applications that do apply to at least clusters of, of episodes. Thank you. Sure. And uh, any of this, like, we can have, like, way longer conversations if you, you know, reach out to me or one of my colleagues. We can, like, really spend time digging into this stuff. Uh, let's see, Carolyn Media. Hi. <laughs> hey. um, thanks for taking my question. Um, would those overarching themes Re, um, relate to documentaries as well then in terms of an audience takeaway because the documentary is a bit more focused than podcasting in the sense that you're examining for one hour or so or maybe even a series of two or three four hour episodes one topic yeah yeah documentaries it yeah applies there as well like really it's it's sort of our general approach in public programs so if you look at pretty much any of our not every single one but most of our grants we do include this type of expectation this type of language yeah okay and it, you're and, right it, it is easier over the course of something a little longer to kind of develop these things yeah yeah it, um and if i may what kind of humanities team and maybe this is a, a follow up for an email or a different conversation with you but the team of humanities scholars that would be pulled together would need to relate to that theme 
I'm I'm gathering. That, that's right. Yeah. So they should have. Uh, so the you know so generally um, you know a competitive proposal has kind of between you know four and seven or eight scholars advising, um, and what we what we are looking for is that um, they collectively they are covering you know the kind of thematic scholarly content of the project, right? Okay. Um, so that so that so for example, what will what we will we raise we do this all the time in review. So well, uh, there's a project and you know there's four advisors um but you know there's a kind of let's say let's say that there's like a, a kind of native american history component uh to the project mm -hmm. but like there's nobody you know either from the community or you know there's no scholar who's like addressing that then that yeah. shoots up a big flag right uh -huh. like, so that's gotcha. that's and it, it's a balance to kind of again it's, it is like a good thing to talk to with, with a program officer but um that yeah. is we are looking for that kind of coverage Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Sure. Yeah, let's see. I got Lisa uh, up next. Lisa Bartby. Uh, you're muted. Sorry about that. I don't know how many years have we been doing Zoom and still missing that part. Yeah. Hi, I'm Lisa Bartby. I'm the producer of a podcast called Dead Writers. Okay. Um, cool. And I'm um, so grateful for this opportunity to chat with you and so thankful for so many of the questions have, have been like, you know, I've been taking copious notes here of the previous questions. So yeah, I think my questions. remaining question um, is a follow up on Milan's first question around um, audience, mm -hmm. and that is specifically regarding audience engagement. Um, mm -hmm. And what kind of engagement we're looking for, you are looking for, um, how, uh, the way, <laughs> we're, we're a scrappy little small production and, you know, uh, we all have other prof professional pursuits, primarily as uh, academics. And mm -hmm. so um, there's a limited amount of resources and time we have for the audience engagement part, although it's tremendously important to us. I think we're running uh, up against, do we try and catch a lot of people in something that perhaps is a little more superficial, say uh, a live podcast event, but it can fill a hundred seats. Or mm -hmm. do we go in and develop um, a high school curriculum and meet with 12 really dedicated high school students? And we yeah. can't really do both. No, yeah, great question. So I would what say that th this is, um that aspect of it is less it, it's like valuable and important but less essential to certainly like getting funded than a lot of the other components right so i would say you know definitely key is building in like an outreach plan um a kind of you know like publicity right like you know getting mentions on other podcasts right you know whatever the kind of best practices are um and the, the sort of curriculum development, um, you know, live events, those are like super, super cool. And they can really be like some nice, like added spice, I would say right. <laughs> to a to a proposal. Um, but if you're if it's a resource question, I would say like, yeah, that was that would be maybe the be the first thing to cut um okay. if you're kind of putting together an application. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, sure. Peter, quickly, is it okay if we put a PDF of your slides in chat? Yes, definitely. No problem. Okay. And then uh, we have a question from Benjamin and T. Hetzel. Do one of you want to pop in and ask your question? And then I think we're going to have to finish it up with Carolyn's question. So we will do those last three for Peter. Okay, great. I could jump in real quick with this is Benjamin. Mine is so simple. It was with these deadlines, you know, with the draft in December, you know, if we were really going for this uh, January 5th deadline, do we need to be in talks with you or your staff by like now or like when, 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 when is the latest you would be take us? Yeah. 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 So first of all, you, you don't have to talk to us at all, right? It's definitely not a requirement. Um, it's really about like, you know, if you have questions, you want some advice, reach out to us. And there's no, I mean, there is a draft deadline, but there's no deadline for talking to us. Right. So uh, it could be literally like the morning of the deadline of the application and, you know, shoot us an email, like give us a call. Like we will, you know, we, we will probably have a lot at that time, right? It might, it's probably not, it's probably not a great at best practices, you know, don't leave the questions until the end. But, um, 
yeah, we are really like available right up until the last minute to uh, to answer questions. Um, and in terms of like, if you want to submit a draft, you also don't have to contact us before you do. You could send it to that. You could send it to me. You could send it to that general email address, um, and it will get read as long as it gets uh, submitted by the by December fifth. Amazing. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, hi, this is this is T. Um, thanks, Peter. Is it useful if you have like an ongoing current podcasting project to include it um, as material to support like your credibility, even though you're pitching a new project that you may have been gathering material on for years, but it's a separate and new project? Yeah, no, definitely. And in fact, we do re require uh, as part of the application, you have to submit a, a sample of prior work. Right. So um, you you would definitely want to do that. And, um, you know, it's best foot forward with with these things. Right. Um, you know, uh, you, you'll you'll you know, even like other work that you've done, um, you know, it'll be there in your your resume. Right. It'll be in your letter. Right. So like really calling attention to that experience and that work is, is going to go a long way. Uh, Mary Ellen, you're muted. Uh, <laughs> Sebastian, do you want to ask your question? Uh, Car Caroline is withdrawing hers. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, thanks for this talk, Peter. I, I really appreciate it. Um, so I I'm from the University of Central Florida History Department, and we're currently developing uh, a podcast network, so a series of podcasts all developed by uh, graduate history students. Mm -hmm. And I, I, was, I, I noted here that the funding for these projects is for production and distribution. So I, my question would be, is it possible to fund more so the network, so to speak, and then these series of podcasts rather than strictly content? Uh, yeah, good question. And yeah, that that is kind of not really the design of the, of the grant program, I would say, right? So I think you could probably build in like a, a little bit of that work, like, uh, and again, making that distribution argument, but the, the lion's share of the funding would, would have to go to, you know, yeah, as you put it, content and, um, you know, creating, producing a podcast. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Sure. Peter, and, and good luck with that, with that network. Thank you. One, one last quick question is, do the humanities scholars need to be from different institutions or can they be from the same? Uh, I would say it is it is highly advisable that they come from different institutions. Um, you could definitely have like a couple or a handful of people from the same institution and that is fine. But if that's like everyone who's advising, then then that's not gonna be competitive. You, you do wanna spread the institutional kind of breadth of the project a little bit. Okay. Um, good evening. I'm sorry, good evening, go sir. Uh, I have a query. I'm, I'm Pranita from India, uh, so I wish pursue research uh, based on podcasts and sound studies so is there any fellowship for that if uh, could you please throw some insight yeah. on that? sure just real real quickly yeah so i i would look at our uh, not this grant program but our research division um and which which does have right fellowships um i think it really depends on the the, the approach you take and and kind of what you want to do with the research but um it may be able to be funded. <laughs> so I would shoot an email to research at neh.gov with that question, and they'll put you in touch with a program officer who can help you help you out with that. Thank you. Peter, thank, thank you sure. so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your advice and all of the time you took today, especially on a Saturday morning. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, no we are about to get started in the 1030 session. So if you wanna pop onto your schedule and follow that Zoom link, uh, we thank you for joining us this morning for this keynote, and uh, we wish you the best of the day for the symposium. Thank you Have all so much. Have a good so symposium, much. everyone. Thank you very much. Appreciate being here. Bye-bye.